play spectacular that we saw this time around. Well, let's start with Domenica Ferraro's Someone Spectacular, which follows the trials and tribulations of a grief support group who suddenly find themselves rudderless as Beth, who leads the group, has gone missing. Should they continue without her, wait, or leave? Impatience and paying off a babysitter to be there wins in staying. They have all lost someone spectacular in their lives. Nell lost her sister to cancer. Jude lost her baby before it was born. Lily lost her mom. Julian lost her beloved aunt, who practically raised him. And Tom lost his wife and soulmate. And Evelyn lost her mom, too. But her relationship with her mom was more complicated. Tempers flare. There are empathetic moments. And tensions are released with a game of Fuck, Mary, Kill, which I've never heard of this game before. This is a very ambiguous play, but in this case, it didn't bother me. And the characters were compelling in their relationship to grief and the way they bonded with each other like a dysfunctional family. There was the suspenseful added element of what really happened to Beth and what about that mysterious beeping sound? And the acting was truly spectacular. Everyone misses someone spectacular in their life. How do you go on from there? I gave this a happy face. I found the play to be kind of flat. Um, while I appreciated, you know, the character development and you being in a room with six strangers who otherwise wouldn't have an opportunity to be together, there wasn't really much that changed over the course of the 90-minute play. Um, the theater configuration was nice. It really felt like you were in the room and there was not a bad seat to be had. Um, with three sides of uh, the auditorium facing inward to this multi-purpose room that I suppose is in a church. Um, but once you leave the show, it doesn't really stick with you as being all that memorable. Um, there were some moments, of course, that were funny, um, or there was a collective laughter across the room. Um, I wouldn't say there were really moments of heartbreak, but there were certainly some moments of confusion. I don't know if you felt that, Eva, um, where it felt like maybe some of the character stories were being tied together in a hallucinatory manner, um, but I give the show mixed face. Breather of Doom undertakes the intimate subject of family relations, which one may agree is more of a universal topic than we care to admit. Uh, you know the deal, those difficult decisions which are done out of love for the other person's situations. Playwright Joe Thristino and director Mark Koenig seductively deliver this most personal set of situations with flair in Bringer of Doom. The play opens with Lottie preparing for her estranged mother's visit. Her mother's name is Esme. To help her get through the visit, Lottie has recruited a neighborhood ex-comedian named Demetrius. Esme, with her young lover by her side, arrives and has her own agenda for the visit. And as is often the case with families, things do not go as planned. Uh, the gifted group of actors carry us through the play with engaging charm, especially during the most controversial moments of their stories. The characters were both lovable and misunderstood. As I watched and gleefully listened, I was taken in by the little mannerisms each actor offered further illustrating both the strength and vulnerability of their character. Also, the costumes are just right for helping the audience understand the demeanor and status of each character. Lottie's Manhattan apartment is the set for the play, which is complete with all the usual quirks and limitations of a New York City apartment. There were just a few moments that were a bit too unbelievable for my taste. However, overall, I thoroughly enjoyed the play, and I highly recommend it. Therefore, I'm giving it a happy face minus. Adam Rapp with Justin Levine's The Outsider with music and lyrics by Jamestown Revival, Jonathan Clay and Zach Chance and Justin Levine is based on the novel by S.E. Hinton and the 1988 film by Francis Ford Coppola. Pony Boy lives with his older brothers, Daryl and Soda Pop, who look after him and each other as they have no parents. 
Daryl is the eldest and the responsible one. So do Pop is a middle child and is a bit of a prankster. He's always smiling. He's sort of the heart and soul of the group. Dally, Dallas, who just got out of prison, rules the rest of the greasers, Steve, Tubit, and Ace. Oh, I should mention there's two gangs. There's the greasers who are the poor people basically on the wrong side of the track and the socials who drive around in their Porsches and have money and everything. So anyway, after Pony Boy gets beat up by the socials for daring to watch Cool Hand Luke on their side of the track, Dally decides it's time for 14-year-old Pony Boy to be initiated by greasing up his hair. There's hope for Pony, Bo Pony Boy yet as he is smart and well-read. He compares his life to great expectations, which he is reading now. Poor orphan falls for rich man, girl, outlaw helps him out. The main socials are Bob, who is their ringleader in beating up the greasers. His girl is the irresistible Cherry Valance, and their friends are Paul, Marcia, and Beverly. Like West Side Story, territory is fought over, a girl is fought over, life is fought over. Everyone is looking for escape, even Cherry Valance, who may be a soch, but they are all stuck in their positions in life. Jan Ewing here. Justin Levine's The Outsiders gives us an all too familiar tale of class struggle as seen through the eyes of two teenage gangs in Tulsa in 1967. The Greasers, the outsiders in question, and the Sox, a gaggle of socialites determined to cause the Greasers as much pain as possible. Pony Boy Curtis, brilliantly sung by Brody Grant, and his best bud, Johnny, touchingly played by Sky Lakota Lynch, live on the wrong side of the tracks. For some reason, they want to cross to the other side of the tracks, which brings them to the attention of the Sox, who already live there. If one is not aware this play is based upon an actual event, it seems at first as if it's a long series of cliches. That said, it's stunning theater. Brilliantly choreographed by Rick and Jeff Cooperman, skillfully directed by Danya Tainer, the cast literally dances its way through the entire play with as much dedicated athleticism as I've ever seen anywhere. The ensemble is first rate, the acting nuanced and intelligent, and aided immeasurably by an excellent script and heartbreaking lyrics from Jamestown Revival. The staging is intensely complicated, and watching this superb cast negotiate its way through its vicissitudes make it a production well worth seeing. Unfortunately, the music doesn't rise to the same level. Jamestown Revival and Mr. Levine have produced a workable score, but there's a sameness about it that soon grows tiresome. It is expository in the extreme and never quite reaches the level of grandeur required by a Broadway musical. Thus, I am giving the outsiders a mixed face with a plus or a brilliant performance. Mixed face plus from me. I agree with Jan about the performances and the choreography of the gang fight is sheer brutal poetry, but this is a very dark and violent musical. I really like the music in this because it was had that kind of like folk, folk music kind of low key charm. And there it was, maybe it was expository, but to me, it just, um, it just not only moved the story along, it kind of moved me as well. So I am giving this a happy face. Ain't Done Bad, conceived, directed, choreographed by Jacob Carr, featuring the music of Orville Peck. And he is an incredible dancer. This is a full length, 75 minute dance piece. He plays the son who's sort of um, understood more by his mother and a little bit afraid of his father. He comes out as gay. He has some club friends who wear sparkly outfits. And he sort of first has trouble, I think, dealing with the gay scene, but later finds a true lover who he's willing to bring home to his parents and reconcile everyone. This was just phenomenal. I haven't seen such incredible dancing. He does the most amazing pirouettes and leaps, and his company is almost as fantastic as his. So um, 
I highly recommend this absolute happy face. Yes. I mean, I have been in love with Jacob Carr for like 10 years since he was so you in so you think he can dance. I used to call and vote for him all the time. Now, I didn't read the program beforehand, so I, I didn't understand what was going on up there until intermission. And then I'm like, oh, oh, OK, that's going on. But it didn't stop me from like looking at this incredible contemporary dance. It was just so like, what mesmerizing. It was so gorgeous. And what. What added even more depth to the piece was the emotional acting from the ensemble. One could feel the misery and fear, joy and jubilation, and deep love and strong friendships. I don't know Orville Peck music, but I do know Unchained Melody, which was used so tenderly here. And like Mark, I found my spirits as lifted as a dancer's high leaps and extensions. An airy, buoyant must-see for the oppressively hot summer. Yeah, it's just, I think everybody would love this. It's just so delightful. Major happy face. Major happy face. In Carrie Gitter's The Sabbath Girl, with music by Neil Berg and lyrics by Neil Berg and Carrie Gitter, is a sweet romantic comedy about two unlikely individuals. Angie wants to make a success of her new art gallery that she's opened on the Lower East Side, but she's kind of in trouble of losing money, perhaps. She's dedicated to this project. She wants to feature the portraits by this artist, Blake, who might be a very good artist, but is a real asshole as a person. And... Uh, down the hall from her, there's an Orthodox Jewish man, Seth, who asks her to help him by turning on his air conditioner and doing other things that, as a religious guy, religious Jew, he can't do. He needed they a Shabbos boy, and in this case, she was a Shabbos goyle. Yes. Sorry, um, I have that yeah, they become very friendly. Um, Seth's sister, who um, is a bit older and sort of uh, controls, I guess, the knish shop that they both work in, also wants to control Seth's life. She doesn't want him to escape the Orthodox community, but he had a bad marriage that was sort of fostered by the community and he's sort of rethinking things and staying away from it. Um, also, Angie has her nona or grandma who gives her really good advice and is always encouraging. Will these people be able to make a go of it despite their different backgrounds? It's really delightful. And you know they will, but it's fun to see how it actually happens. I give it a happy face, minus, because there were a few things that were off. Yeah, I mean, I was so surprised. That, and in fact, the press agent was so surprised that Mark liked this because normally you don't like these sweet little romantic comedy, you know, Thing. It was enjoyable, and I liked both characters, and they seemed very believable. Exactly. And the funny thing is, is, I saw this as a play a few years ago, and I was saying to the press, oh, I've seen this already. But I didn't see it as a musical. I saw it as a play. So that shows you how great that this was turned into a musical. It, they integrated the music so well that I didn't even realize that it wasn't a musical to begin with. And I got to say, when I saw this a few years ago, I, I loved this. It was like the play I'd been waiting for, a play about a religious Jew that is a man and is trying to deal in a goyish world, something I could finally relate to, my turn to feel represented. And I originally, I gave this a major, major happy face plus, but feelings change. 
I was annoyed that the conflict or bad guy was represented by the Orthodox Jewish sister who didn't want Seth to have anything to do with a non-Jew. Meanwhile, Angie's Italian Catholic, whatever, Nana was all for love, no matter what background they have. As in the play, I was surprised they still had this scene that didn't vibe with Seth's Orthodox upbringing. It totally threw me off. The sister's not really a bad guy. Um, tradition works perfectly for her, and she thinks it should be good for her brother, but um, he really is moving in another direction. But um, she's, you know, just someone who is living a life that's perfectly suited for her. Uh, to me, and she gets to sing. Uh, the sister sings the heartfelt something bigger than us. She mm -hmm. reminds me of Anita in West Side Story of stick to your own kind. <laughs> and you forgot to mention the artist that um, because Angie has his artist gallery and she's mm -hmm. trying to get this really hot shot artist Blake to be um, part of her gallery. And he's conceited artist to the hilt. And as an artist with no substance, he was hilariously obnoxious. And he also was pursuing Angie. So there was a bit of a triangle. So to me, this is the kind of wonderful love story, like Crossing Delancey, that I find so appealing. But I am giving this a happy face minus. At the Lucille Lortel Award last May, I caught up with Wade McCollum, who's currently like the bad guy in Water for Elephants. And... I had a wonderful talk with him. I just adore this actor. And you guys got to see Water for Elephant because I notice it's not doing very well and it should be because it's such a wonderful musical. So guys, go see Water for Elephant, please. Hello, here we are with... Wade McCullough. You are one of these actors. I never recognize you, but when I see the name, I get excited. <laughs> Ever since Ernest Shackleton in Love, I love that show. Uh, so you are made me gorgeous, but you're in something else right now. Yeah, I just ran from a matinee of Water for Elephants. That was it. That I, I knew. I love Pig Pen. Yeah. Yeah. I have been a fan of them for 20 years when they did the Fridge show, A Nightmare Story. So to see them on Broadway is thrilling. I agree. They are so incredible. Such a collaborative, creative, ragtag group of pros. Love them. So tell us about your character in Water for Elephants. Oh, his name is Wade, like me, which is very bizarre. Um, and he's sort of, uh, he's a dark, kind of shadowy fellow. Um, he's sort of the henchman for our antagonist, I would say. Yeah. Well, every character needs a bad guy, and it can't just be the ringmaster. Yeah, it's true. He's, he's a bit broken, and his brokenness is leveraged by intelligent, manipulative humans. But we still kind of feel a little bit bad for him. I mean, yeah, I have empathy for him. You know, I think I, I always think about poverty at the time. I think, you know, his access to any resources or any nourishment to help him out of his hard time, he didn't have those, so. He didn't have very many friends, though everyone sort of shunned him. Exactly, ultimately I feel like he just needs a hug. <laughs> well, I'm so pleased you're in Water for Elephants, and congratulate on Made Me Gorgeous, which was really wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, it's good. Such a different role. <laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> yes, you're a good actor. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Sean King's Airport and the Strange Package taps into the frustration of traveling today with all the safety rules and regulations. You know the routine when flying, don't leave luggage unattended, don't transport any item for someone you don't know. If you see something, say something. This is announced to us at the start of the play. Our intrepid traveler has this very thing happen to him when a stranger hands him a mysterious package to put overhead in compartment 19A. Naturally, he assumes the worst and immediately tries to hand it to a policeman who sends it to a room to fill out inane questions on a form from a sympathetic employer who leaves and becomes a mean one. He is then sent to a room where this duo that escaped from that movie Deliverance questions him and makes his life hell. The he just wants to do his civic duty and catch his flight. Instead, he finds himself in a Kafka-esque nightmare. Can he get out of this non-ending spiral of suspicions and hidden agendas? This was a very funny satirical dark look at how the TSA has taken things too far. 
as someone who can't stand all these absurd restrictions of travel with taking off shoes, which is only in America. I just got back from traveling to London and Spain, as you know, and they don't bother people with a cane with all this nonsense. Also, the way they take away your rice pudding and yogurt, I'm afraid to travel because I have no idea what they will confiscate on a whim. So for anyone who travels by air, this will hit home and a home run. And the cast were all very accomplished in making broad comedy very believable. Because it was so amusing, the shocking end gave it even more of a punch line. I will say no more. You has just have to see this for yourself. And I did miss the beginning of this because for some stupid reason, I went to the wrong theater. But if you read Sasha Clark's review on Facebook, she goes into detail on how this starts which I hear is you get snacks and other things like you're really in an airplane, which I'm sorry I missed. Oh, and I'm giving it a happy face. The Meeting the Interpreters, written by Catherine Gropper and directed by Brian Mertes. The meeting concerns itself with one that occurred at Trump Tower, New York City on June 9th, 2016 with Donald Trump Jr., some members of Donald Trump Sr.'s election campaign, and former Russian prosecutor Natalia Veselnitskaya and her interpreter, who is obviously very brilliant at what he does, and she's willing to pay a fortune for him, but he feels a little bit uncomfortable with some of the things she brings him to. I had to look up all this stuff in Wikipedia because I really couldn't follow anything that was going on. There was um, a like, video being made and a dolly going on a circular train track and all sorts of like irrelevant kind of gestures that might have worked better in an Anne Bogart CD piece. and. I basically really hated this. <laughs> so for me, it's an unhappy face. Yeah, basically, I agree with everything that Mark Sabat said. This play is for people who like numbers and lists and detailed minutia. It's more a statement of facts than a play. Only the fact that you had the high caliber of Frank Wood and Kelly Curran performing these thankless roles that kept me from hightailing it out of there. And I can't read something that I just didn't grasp at all. I wasn't even going to say anything because I'm like, I just, I just, I don't want to say anything bad about anything Frank Wood is in. It just, it just goes against my, my, my very being, but I just had no idea what was going on. In fact, I read another review which said that after this play, everyone's gonna be hightailing it to figure this thing out. I mean, it's just not a play. Well, it is, but it's a bad one. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Once Upon a Mattress with music by Mary Rogers, lyrics by Marshall Bearer and a book by Jay Thompson, Dean Fuller and Marshall Bearer, takes the princess and the pea and stands it on its head. Well, I have never seen Once Upon a Mattress. Um, I have, there's a lot of Broadway classics I've never seen. I've never seen Sutton Foster in a play. So this to me was a real eye opener on both counts. I mean, the play has been updated from the original 1959 Musical. version. It had to be. Um, but Sutton Foster and Michael Urey were a delight to watch. And I didn't watch any of the gymnastics in the Paris Olympics, but between these two, ultra limber stars i felt like I, like i actually did get to see some gymnastics um my favorite was anna gasteyer because she was just so imperious and she had the best line of the night when she tells sutton foster as when for the world began, that it was time to go back to her quote kingdom of sludge unquote which just had me on the floor daniel breaker and brooks s ashman manskas as the jester and the wizard were great they were this witty duo with dueling puns and really fast repartee that helped to move the uh, the proceedings along and it was their machinations that actually won the day in the end because it doesn't stick to the fairy tale but it was great um 
I found the weakest link to be Renee Daniels, Nikki Renee Daniels. Not her fault. I mean, she was basically just written in as a plot mover alonger. Um, but it was so funny and so much fun. And it, for a couple of hours, it just takes you away from the world and all the craziness that's going on. So I give it a happy face plus. Go see it. You'll spend two hours laughing in the most beautiful theater on Broadway because the Hudson Theater is the only original Gilded Age Broadway theater still left standing. And the seats are huge. They're not torture devices. So go see Once Upon a Mattress. You will not regret it. Plus, we should mention that it was adapted by Amy Sherman Palladino, who also did The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Bunheads with Sutton Foster. And Sutton Foster was reunited with Daniel Breaker when they both did Shrek and Daniel was the donkey and she was Princess Fiona. And this was directed by Lear de Bessina and the choreography was Lauren Lataro, who's really good at choreography. Our next show is September 7th. There's a lot of stuff going on at 54 Below, including Scott Siegel, September 3rd, Songs of One Named Divas. And 92NY is back with many programs, starting with Katie Ledecky, who just won all those gold medals. Uh, you got the Soho Playhouse, and you got 5090, 59th Street going on both till September 1st, Bleeding Class and Unentitled. The Festival of Free Shakespeare in the Park now is going on till September 6th in, in various boroughs. And this is a public theater, and they have a costume exhibit until August 30th. New to New York at York's Theater starting August 28th at St. Jean's. And TNC has got their summer festival going on with the socialization of a social worker or justice in a time of need. And the Dream Up Festival will be starting August 25th. Theater of the Apes is doing Wayfaring Strangers Improvised Bluegrass Musical at the Pit on August 25th at 7 o'clock. And excuse my language, but Cunt Boy and Dick Girl or Biology Play will be going on with August 28th and 29th at 7.30 at the Maker Studio at Chelsea Market. And Antonio Finney announces the 14th Annual Finney Dance Festival and Italian International Dance Awards hosted by Milan's Tabata Calderoni, Saturday, August 31st at 8 o'clock at the Ally City Group Theater. And closing September 7th will be Hurricane Season at Theater Row and Sex in the Abbey at the Brick Theater. <laughs> Thank you.